Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Justine Baqueta, and it's my uh, great pleasure to share this session on uh, cystinosis today. And we have the great pleasure to have uh, Professor Levchenko from Leuven in Belgium, who is an international expert on the disease, to present us uh, an update on cystinosis. And Dr. Levchenko um, is uh, currently the president of the European Society of Pediatric Nephrology. She is a board member of the ESPN Working Group on Inherited Renal Disorders, and she's an executive board member of the International Pediatric Nephrology Association. She is also a co-chair of the Working Group on Metabolic and Stone Forming of the European Reference uh, ERCNET Network, and her main topic of interest is uh, tuberculosis and cystinosis. Elena, thank you so much, and uh, help us to understand this uh, disease. Thank you very much, Justine, for this uh, kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, happy to welcome you to this webinar. Um, from uh, my office in Leuven, Belgium. Uh, here you can see my disclosures. And this slide shows you the uh, overview of my lecture. So as many of you know, um, cystinosis is an autosomal recessive disease uh, caused by lysosomal accumulation of cystine due to defective exodus of cystine out of the lysosomes of all cells of the body. The disease is rather rare. It occurs in one in 100,000 to 200,000 newborns. And there is some clustering in uh, several populations like the uh, French population of Quebec. And uh, for example, uh, there is also a cluster of patients in the northern of uh, the Netherlands. Uh, while the disease is quite rare, it is the most common cause of inherited and generalized proximal tubular dysfunction, uh, which is also called renal Fanconi syndrome. And it uh, progresses towards end-stage renal disease without treatment. Cystinosis is caused by their mutations in the gene, which is called um, CTNS. Um, it, it was cloned on the chromosome 17 by the International Consortium guided by Corinne Antignac. This gene encodes a protein called cystinosin, which is normally located on the lysosomal membrane, and it transports the amino acid cystin out of the lysosome together with protons, so it is cystin-proton uh, co-transporter. In patients with cystinosis, um, the cystin, uh, cystinosin is mutated, and um, in these patients, uh, cystin cannot um, exit the lysosome. It accumulates and it forms a cystin crystals, which we do find in all cells of these uh, patients. So the most common mutation um, in CTNS gene found in the North European population is a large 57 KB deletion on the chromosome 17. It also removes two uh, adjacent genes called carcal and uh, uh, another uh, calcium channel called TRPV1. However, we are really not sure how, um, to which extent their um, deletion of these genes contribute to their clinical phenotype of the patients. However, in other world population, there are other hotspot mutations, and uh, so far there are about 140 different mutations described in cystinosis. The mutation detection rate is extremely high, it's above 95%, and there are all kinds of mutations found, nonsense, missing, splight side, also promoter mutations, and also micro deletions and duplications. We do find genotype-phenotype correlations in these patients with severe mutations, mostly leading to their severe phenotype. So um, when we look uh, clinically at the cystinosis patients, we distinguish two uh, uh, phenotypes in a uh, patient having uh, kidney involvement. The most frequent um, uh, nephropathic uh, phenotype in these patients in the infantile form which presents uh, with renal Fanconi syndrome during the first months of life. And these patients without treatment uh, invariably present uh, progress towards end-stage renal disease by the age of 10 years. In patients with uh, so-called late onset or juvenile cystinosis, 
which is diagnosed in the minority of the patients. Um, their disease presents later in age and sometimes during pu puberty. Most of the patients have mild tubulopathy, but more pronounced proteinuria, which can be even in the nephrotic range. And sometimes um, some patients with nephrotic syndrome might have cystinosis. And these patients are generally progress later in life towards end-stage renal disease. And there is one peculiar uh, benign form of cystinosis, oculocystinosis, which is characterized by cystin, uh, uh, cystin accumulation in the cornea, uh, causing uh, ocular complaints, but it has no systemic involvement. As I have said, uh, patients with severe mutations mostly have a severe infantile form, while patients with milder mutations have late onset form or uh, ocular form of cystinosis. So cystinosis is really a multi-systemic disorder affecting many different organs in the body, which you can see on this slide. However, the first um, uh, organ which is affected is the kidney, and uh, therefore we as pediatric nephrologists first um, see these patients. So a kidney is really the first organ affected by cystinosis. So when you look um, in general terms on the pathogenesis of kidney disease and cystinosis, uh, we know it that um, the disease um, first occurs in kidney proximal tubules and it causes renal Fanconi syndrome. However, we have shown that um, glomeruli are also affected by cystinosis, resulting in the glomerular proteinuria and the formation of uh, focal and segmental glomerulosclerosis lesions. The progression towards end-stage kidney disease is associated with the development of renal interstitial inflammation in fibrosis, which we do find in the biopsies of these patients. So when we look in more detail on the mechanism of proximal tubular dysfunction in these patients, we see that patients with cystinosis lose a lot of proximal tubular cells into urine. The proximal tubular cells of these patients undergo a high rate of apoptosis, and altogether it leads to the loss of proximal tubular mass in these patients, resulting in the formation of the specific proximal tubular atrophic lesions very close to their glomeruli, which are called a swan neck deformity because the nephrologists are very poetic and they compare um, the glomeruli or the tubuli to some animals. Um, Another mechanism found in these patients is the impaired mitochondrial function, increased oxidative stress, and this also can contribute to renal Fanconi syndrome because you know that uh, renal proximal tubules are a very high energy consuming a part of the nephron with a lot of mitochondria are present there and with a high energy demand. More recent studies found that um, uh, cystinotic proximal tubular show uh, defective vesicle trafficking and also defects in autophagy, altogether resulting in the dedifferentiation of the proximal tubules, reduced expression of the proximal tubular transporters, altogether contributing to the renal Fanconi syndrome. On the other hand, impaired autophagy and specifically impaired autophagy of old mitochondria results in enhanced oxidative stress, also leading to the inflammation and fibrosis. So polycyte dysfunction is also present in cystinotic kidneys and also probably starting from quite young age. Cystinosis patients do lose uh, high numbers of polycytes into urine. Um, in vitro, we have shown that cystinotic podocytes have increased uh, motility and uh, decreased adhesion in vitro. And we also do find morphologic changes in cystinotic kidneys, which are very comparable um, uh, with patients having other proteinuric disorders, such as podocyte food process effacement, and also um, the presence of multinucleated podocytes. Altogether, this results in the glomerular proteinuria and the formation of the FSGS lesions. So here you can see a very typical lesion in the cystinotic kidney, the presence of uh, hypertrophic multinucleated podocytes, which is a very early and characteristic feature of these kidneys. Later, during the degrees progression, we can find the FSGF lesions, which are really undistinguishable from other FSGS patients. 
And when the disease progresses towards end-stage kidney disease, we do find the global collapse of the glomerulus. So I have told that the progression towards uh, chronic kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease is associated with the formation of renal interstitial inflammation and fibrosis. Interestingly, um, when you look at the cystinotic kidneys, um, we find our cystine crystals mainly located in the renal interstitium, either free or in the interstitial histocyte, uh, histocytes or macrophages. Upon um, um, phagocytosis of their cystine crystals, these cells can get activated and um, especially interstitial macrophages start to produce uh, um, uh, different uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines uh, as a result of the activation of inflammasomes. Um, and this probably contributes to the development of renal interstitial inflammation and fibrosis, which is so important in the disease progression of these patients. So coming back to the clinics, how do we diagnose cystinosis? Obviously, we have to think about this disease uh, because the disease is rare. So this physician should be aware uh, about this condition. And we have to suspect uh, cystinosis in all patients present with renal Fanconi syndrome. Um, another um, way to diagnose these patients is to look in their eyes because all of them have a uh, cystine crystal accumulation, especially starting from the age of one year. So patients with unexplained eye complaints and especially patients with unexpected photophobia should be suspected for cystinosis. Another clinical presentation, mainly in the patients with milder forms of cystinosis, can be an explained presence of glucosuria and proteinuria, especially in patients without diabetes. And in these patients, it's essential to check for the presence of low molecular weight proteins, which are very characteristic for this disorder. So when we uh, suspect cystinosis, we can diagnose this condition very easily because we can measure the elevated cystine content in white blood cells, granulocytes, and we have normal values in healthy uh, controls in heterozygous of the patients, which are the parents, and also in patients at the diagnosis. There is a variability in cystine measurements, and therefore it's very important to have the reference values for your own laboratory. As I have told you, cystine crystals are seen uh, in all patients with cystinosis above the age of one year. They can be missed in younger patients. And um, when we want to confirm the diagnosis, we perform the molecular analysis of the cystinosis gene, uh, which is very important for the genetic counseling of the, parent, of the families. How do we treat cystinosis? So most of the patients with cystinosis pr present with a very pronounced renal Fanconi syndrome, which has to be treated. These patients need a free access to water and toilet, and it's really very important to avoid the dehydration, which can really additionally dam damage their kidney function. It is very important to provide an adequate nutritional support because a lot of these patients would have a poor appetite and vomiting. And then we have to supplement um, their uh, urinary losses of electrolytes, uh, calcium and uh, phosphate. Uh, several of these patients develop also copper deficiency, so copper can also be supplemented. I'm not going to read all these dosages. You can find um, a very good table uh, in the review published recently by Conrad Wade and Current Opinion of Pediatrics, when you can find uh, the all requested doses. Also, despite the adequate nutrition and treatment of renal Fanconi syndrome, uh, a lot of patients with cystinosis still will have poor growth. And uh, in this patient, the treatment with growth hormone is really recommended. Most of the cystinosis patients respond very well to the growth hormone treatment, especially when they are not on dialysis. So this treatment can really be recommended in these patients. Um, when renal Fanconi syndrome is very severe and not well controlled with um, a supplementation of drug, in a lot of European centers, we are using indomethacin to reduce urinary losses. Um, the rationale for this treatment comes from um, this small publication uh, 
um, done in about 35 years ago, which was for the first time demonstrating the administration of um, endomethacin in uh, three children with cystinosis was really helpful to increase sodium reabsorption to reduce uh, free water clearance and to improve plasma concentration of potassium bicarbonate and phosphate. Uh, interesting, this small uh, publication, no um, uh, deterioration of kidney function was observed, but it was also a short-term administration of endometacin. However, uh, we are always a little bit concerned while, we, while administering ad, uh, endometacin for the long time because we know that this administration can be associated with the development of the interstitial fibrosis, which is already present in this patient. However, uh, our recent analysis of um, data from the large European cohort of cystinosis patients, which was collected within their European project uh, UNEFROM, showed um, that um, uh, patients who were on endometacin uh, compared to patients who were uh, off endometacin, and this is a Kaplanian curve of the kidney function survival and the probability of um, end-stage kidney disease. Uh, we found that actually patients who were on endometacin did slightly better compared to the patients who were off endometacin. Um, this is a reassuring observation. We don't really know uh, the reason for that. It might be that the patients um, with cystinosis uh, on endometacin had uh, um, lower numbers of dehydration episodes. Maybe endometacin had some independent anti-inflammatory effect in this patient, but the results are quite good, and I think it is rather safe to use endometacin in these patients. Um, another question which is frequently asked because patients with cystinosis do have glomerular disease and they have sometimes quite severe proteinuria and here you can see the western blot of cystinotic urine showing the presence of um, different proteins and not only low molecular weight proteins such as alpha-1 microglobulin but also of larger proteins such as transferrin, albumin or vitamin D binding protein. So the question is whether these patients should be treated with ACE inhibitors, as we do in many other proteinuric conditions. And actually, when you do this, and this is a small publication in a few number of patients, when we administer ACE inhibitors in these patients, we do see the reduction of albuminuria, which can be the reason to treat these patients with ACE inhibitors. And then a small um, one center uh, study coming from the group of Francesca Emma, it was demonstrated that the use of ACE inhibitors decreased the risk of chronic renal failure um, in their patients. However, once again, when we looked at the larger cohort of cystinotic patients in Europe, we did not find any difference in the deterioration of kidney function between patients who were or not treated with ACE inhibitors. Once again, we really don't have um, any explanation for this observation. We had also no information on the dose duration of therapy and also whether the antiproteinuric effect was present. Uh, many people um, do administer ACE inhibitors. I also do it in my clinical practice. However, what is very important to realize that the combination of endometacin and ACE inhibitors should really be avoided because it increases the risk of acute kidney uh, injury, especially in patients who are already uh, dehydrated or salt depleted, as it can be the case in cystinosis patients. So fortunately for cystinotic patients, we have a specific treatment with cystiamine, which can deplete intracellular cystine accumulation. Cystiamine is a small aminotyl, which can penetrate in cells and in the lysosomes. It um, can react with cystine inside of the lysosomes, and it breaks cystine molecules in cysteine and cysteine cystiamine mixed disulfide which can exit the lysosomes via the different transporters and therefore can bypass the defective cystinosin transporter. And initially it has been demonstrated in in vitro studies that the incubation of the cystinotic cells with cystiamine can deplete intracellular cystine accumulation in a concentration dependent manner. 
So uh, very uh, quickly after this uh, in vitro studies, uh, cysteamine was introduced into their uh, clinical practice. And um, this pivotal study coming from the NIH group showed that um, the administration of cysteamine in cystinotic patients, um, and this is the age of the patient, and this is their creatinine cl clearance on their y-axis, um, that the administration of cysteamine, especially when the treatment was started earlier before the age of two years and was regularly monitored based on their concentration of cysteine in white blood cells, so, uh, white blood um, cells. Uh, this treatment could really uh, protect kidney function from the deterioration, which was uh, not observed in patients who were untreated or partially treated. Starting from this um, study, um, in most of their um, centers treating cystinosis patients, the cystamine was introduced. Here you can see the recommended dose of the drug. And nowadays we have two preparations. Uh, one is uh, immediate release preparation cystacone, which has to be administered, administered every six hours. And um, delayed release preparation called prosisbir, which can be administered every 12 hours. Uh, those of us who treat this patient know that these are difficult drugs to be used. They have several side effects, such as uh, gastrointestinal complaints, and also they are metabolized in their um, um, substances, which have a very bad um, odor, giving the bad odor to the breath and their body smell, which really limits the compliance of the patients. And therefore, as doctors, we really have to fight for the compliance and explain our patients again and again how important is the tr this treatment for their, uh, for their kidneys and for their extrarenal organs. So uh, this um, couple of main curve, again, from their um, large European um, cohort of cystinosis patients shows that the age uh, uh, starting from which cysteamine was administered really matters for the kidney uh, function survival. Here we have put cutoff age at 1.5 years. However, there is really no cutoff age, and we know now that the earlier cysteamine is administered, the better is the prognosis of the kidney function in these patients. Uh, despite cystamine treatment, um, many of cystinosis patients still reach end-stage kidney disease at adolescent or young adult age. And when we look worldwide at the registers of renal replacement therapy, we find that about 1 to 2 percent of uh, all our patients in renal replacement re uh, registries are due to cystinosis. And this data is quite comparable between the registries around the world in Europe and North America and also in the Asia and New Zealand. Both peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis are suitable to dialyze cystinosis patients. Uh, there is no evidence that cystamine dose should be adjusted um, in patients on dialysis. However, um, it might be that the metabolism of cysteamine can be impaired in end-stage kidney disease patients. I have heard it last year from Dr. Langman in Chicago. However, this data still needs to be published. So the kidney transplantation and cystinosis has actually really excellent results. Um, nephrectomy of the native kidneys is not um, always necessary. There are some centers who publish data on their needs of uh, nephrectomy in patients with persistent polyuria. The immunosuppressive treatment is really similar uh, to non-cystinotic kidneys. However, because patients with cystinosis are, are prone to develop the diabetes, we should really um, uh, need to have preference for steroid-free regimens whenever possible. The disease doesn't recur in the kidney graft because it doesn't have the mutant protein. The parents can be accepted as kidney donors, and we have a lot of excellent kidney survivors um, in parents in their patients having their kidney graft from their, from their family members. What is very important to realize is that cystamine treatment has to be restarted when patients can take oral medications after transplantation actually as soon as possible and it should be continued lifelong. So this um, 
and data from the European um, Registry on Renal Replacement Therapy shows that uh, renal graft survival in patients with cystinosis is actually superior compared to the non-cystinotic patients. And um, these um, results were not confirmed in the North American um, Registry of uh, Renal Replacement Therapy. However, um, um, I think that we really can see that uh, the results of kidney transplantation in cystinosis are excellent, and uh, this is a good treatment for these patients. So coming back um, to the patients and to this slide, um, I would like to stress that cystinosis is really a multi-organ disorder. And you can see that next to the kidneys, virtually all other organs such as eyes, um, thyroids, pancreas, gonads, liver, muscles, and brains can be affected by cystinosis. And therefore, it is extremely important that Patients with cystinosis also after kidney transplantation should be treated with cystiamine. And this uh, slides um, from the publication from the NIH group really um, uh, shows uh, that uh, while patients with cystinosis without cystiamine treatment develop different complications such as diabetes, severe myopathy, lung dysfunction, and actually have a high rate of death of, at young age, Patients who are on cystiamine treatment uh, are doing much better and a lot of extra renal complications can be prevented in these patients. So this really means that um, cystiamine should be also administered in patients after kidney transplantation and continued lifelong in these patients. Well, uh, I think I have shown you that cystiamine is a very good drug. It does a lot in cystinotic cells. It decreases cystine accumulation. Cystiamine is actually also an excellent, uh, excellent antioxidative agent. So it reduces oxidative stress and inflammation. And it has also a positive effect on apoptosis. However, unfortunately, cystiamine has no effect on renal Fanconi syndrome when the renal Fanconi syndrome is established. And therefore, there is really need for novel therapies in cystinosis. There are some, several compounds which are now uh, being tested in in vivo and in vitro models. These compounds are um, actually uh, aiming to target different pathogenetic mechanisms in cystinotic cells, such as altered vesicle trafficking and um, altered lysosomal morphology and dynamics. There are drugs which are enhancing exocytosis of their cystinotic lysosomes to the extracellular space. There are also drugs which are targeting oxidative stress and inflammation. And there are also drugs which are uh, aiming to improve the impaired autophagy in the cystinotic cells. So some of these drugs are quite potent and uh, our, our and other groups have shown that uh, some of these compounds really can improve renal Fanconi syndrome, at least in vitro and also in the animal models. So there are some um, treatments in the pipeline and hopefully they will reach um, cystinosis patients uh, very soon. So I would like to devote the last five minutes of my presentation on a new uh, treatment, uh, which is the hematopoietic stem cell transplantation in cystinosis. So uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation have been previously used in other lysosomal storage disorders. And it has been very elegantly demonstrated by the group of Stephanie Cherki in uh, San Diego that this treatment is efficient in the cystinosis mouse model. In this model, they demonstrated that um, this treatment can decrease cystine accumulation in different tissues. It preserved kidney function of the mouse on short and also long term. And um, this effect was really dependent on the efficiency of engraftment. And they also have demonstrated that uh, this treatment improves extra renal complications in the mouse model. So um, there was a big discussion on the mechanism of action of the hematopoietic stem cells. And again, the group of Stephanie Cherki very uh, nicely demonstrated that hematopoietic stem cell can engraft in the interstitium of different organs, where these cells differentiate into tissue macrophages. 
where they can, at one hand, clear on, uh, perform the clearance of the existing crystals. And on the other hand, these cells can perform the cross-correction um, of the neighboring epithelial cells uh, via uh, developing of their um, tunneling nanotubes between the macrophaging and the adjacent epithelial cells. And here you can see um, how it happens. So here you can see the kidney tissue of the cystinotic mouse where hematopoietic stem cells differentiated into macrophages are stained in green and the kidney epithelial cells are stained in blue. Their tubular uh, basement membrane is stained here in red. And you can see that these uh, macrophages can make the protrusions uh, towards their sick tubular epithelial cells. And uh, here you can see that these protrusions are very thin tubes, which are called nanotubes. And these tubes contain uh, healthy lysosomes and also mitochondria. And they can um, bring the healthy materials, healthy uh, CTNS proteins to the epithelial cells. So this all sounds very promising and uh, the group um, persisted on this treatment and actually now they are very close uh, to the initiation of the clinical trial in cystinotic patients. The way they are going to, um, to do, they are going to use their uh, own uh, hematopoietic stem cells of cystinotic patients, which will be corrected with the lentiviral vectors are containing their wild type CTNS gene. They are going initially to include um, adult patients at least one year after kidney transplantation. And the first aim of this trial mainly is uh, to check the safety of this approach. So um, I would like to share with you um, our own experience with hematopoietic stem cell transplantation in uh, cystinosis. So, uh, this treatment was performed in a male patient with cystinosis who was diagnosed at the age of two years and eight months. This patient had a very severe renal Fanconi syndrome and um, he developed uh, the signs of cystiamine toxicity which limited the administration of cystiamine in this patient and he demonstrated the deterioration of this kidney function. At the age of 16 years after uh, um, a long negotiation with the family and uh, with our oncology department, uh, we performed their um, allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation from their full uh, HLA match donor. Uh, here you can see the uh, conditions of this transplantation. Uh, we observed their uh, engraftment of hematopoietic stem cell 22 days after transplantation. And uh, the transplantation resulted in the full donor chimerism found in bone marrow and also in blood. In blood. So um, after transplantation, um, uh, we found um, uh, a slight, uh, after the initial increase of the diuresis, uh, we found the uh, reduction of the diuresis and also the improvement of renal Fanconi syndrome. Uh, while in the beginning of the after transplantation, their kidney function remained stable. After about 30 uh, weeks after transplantation, the kidney function deteriorated. And you can see that um, later on, the patient uh, had increased uh, diuresis and finally ended up at the dialysis. So another uh, observation which we made in this patient and that um, after uh, hematopoietic stem transplantation, the accumulation of cystine crystals in their tissues, and here you can see the gastric tissue, was really decreased. When we looked at the expression of wild type CTNS gene uh, at messenger RNA level, and this was done in the proximal tubular cell of the patient, who before the transplantation obviously expressed only the mutant protein, after the transplantation in the proximal tubular cells, we found that 22% alleles express, or the tested alleles express the wild type CTNS. And actually the expression of the wild type cystinosin was even higher in the liver of the patient. So when we looked at the protein expression, um, 
and this is uh, the staining done uh, against the cystinosin LKG and were performed in Rome. We found, and this is a gastric um, mucosa, that obviously before the transplantation there was no expression of wild dye protein in this patient. However, post-transplantation, several epithelial cells in this patient did express wild type cystinosin. So um, uh, these were their positive observation in these cases. In this case, however, the clinical course of this patient was really dramatic. He developed a very severe complication of the procedure. Initially, he developed the acute graft versus host disease. He developed uh, numerous central nervous system complications, uh, including the severe neurologic toxicity of multiple drugs. Finally, he developed the partial graft failure due to the parvovirus B19 infection and requested the second hematopoietic stem cell infusion from the same donor. Later on, he developed the therapy-resistant chronic GVHD and finally died due to multi-resistant pseudomonas infection. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. So I have told you that um, to diagnose cystinosis, we really need the high level of suspicion in patients presenting with renal Fanconi syndrome or unexplained proteinuria in combination with glucosuria. In this patient, the eye examination and cystine measurements are, can uh, make the diagnosis, which can be confirmed by the DNA test in the patient. Um, patients, with cystine, patients should be treated with cystiamine, which really remains the mainstay in therapy in these patients. The early administration of cystiamine improves kidney function prognosis and also should be continued after kidney transplantation to protect extra renal organs. I have shown you that there are several novel therapies underway. However, um, I think our case really demonstrates that we have um, to make a very careful balance between risk and uh, benefit uh, of these novel therapies. So at the end, I would like to acknowledge all people who are working with me on cystinosis. We have a multidisciplinary cystinosis clinic in Leuven, and I would like to acknowledge everybody who contributes to this clinic. I would like to thank people who work with me in the lab, in our pediatric nephrology lab. I would like to acknowledge all cystinosis patients who are always very supportive and really deliver a lot of ideas from, for our research. I would like to thank uh, the ERCnet for giving me the opportunity to present this data. And before um, going up to the questions, um, I would like to announce our next webinar, which will be given by Beata Lipsky, um, and it will be on Shimka immunosis dysplasia on the 7th of May. Thank you very much um, for your attention, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Elena, for this uh, excellent presentation and this very clear and detailed overview on uh, cystinosis and the therapeutic uh, perspectives. We already have two questions from the audience and we are almost uh, 50 today, so this is uh, very good. So don't be shy and just uh, send me your questions so that I can read them to Elena. And the first question is rather clinical. And it's like, how can we differentiate cystinosis from other causes of renal Fanconi syndrome? Uh, thank you very much uh, for your question. Um, on the clinical basis, it is um, actually very difficult to differentiate cystinosis from other forms of renal Fanconi syndrome, especially in the inherited forms of renal Fanconi syndrome. It is very important to realize that renal Fanconi syndrome can be also due to the toxicity of drugs, uh, um, such as uh, hemotherapeutics, also uh, anti-epileptic drugs, and also some antibiotics. So when you see a patient with renal Fanconi syndrome, it's very important to perform the good clinical history um, to know whether the, um, the renal Fanconi syndrome is not due to one of these therapeutics. However, when you have a patient with inherited form of renal Fanconi syndrome, you can always, or you should always suspect cystinosis. You will not be able to distinguish based on their clinics. And in this patient, it's important to perform um, cystine measurements in white blood cell if this measurement is available in your country. 
and if the patient is older than one, uh, your ophthalmologist really can make the diagnosis because cysting crystals in the eyes uh, are very pathognomonic. However, for detecting them, you need to do the slit lamp examination, but slit lamps are available in all eye clinics all over the world. I hope I could answer this question. Okay, I think it was uh, really clear. Uh, we have um, another clinical question, and it's uh, why cystinosis uh, does not recur on the graft after transplantation? Uh, also, again, it's a very good question. Um, so, cystinosis um, is uh, a disease which is due to the mutation in the lysosomal uh, transporter. So if you give a patient a kidney um, of a donor who doesn't have cystinosis, so this kidney will have uh, the normal cystinosin protein in the lysosome, there is no reason why the disease would recur because there is no genetic defect in this kidney. Okay, and um, we still have Another cl clinical question is how often should you check cysteine levels in patients on cystermine therapy? So can you please, why should you, why or? How often? Uh, do we have to, uh, yeah. <clears throat> How often and do we have so? Um, so in the most of the um, uh, cystinosis clinics, we uh, check cystine levels in um, white blood cells in children uh, every three months because the children are growing and uh, the dose has to be adjusted quite uh, frequently. In adult patients who are not growing and have a rather stable condition, most of the clinics are checking once per year. Okay, so um, still some clinical questions and I'm a little bit frustrated because I was thinking that somebody would ask a question on bone in cystinosis. Anyway, so the clinical question is, when do you stop indometacine in these patients? Um, usually it's not our first line of treatment. Uh, we first start to urge as a regular treatment of renal Fanconi syndrome and uh, we see how the patient is doing. However, in some patients, it's really impossible to have a good control and uh, it can be already a patient uh, before the age of one year. So when we cannot reach the adequate metabolic mm -hmm. control and nutrition uh, in these patients um, uh, with uh, just regular supplements and cystamine treatment, as a second line of treatment will be, cyst uh, will be indomethacin. And it can be actually, yeah, at the age of uh, yeah, nine months, 12 months, also later on, all depends on the clinical condition of the patient and the renal losses. Okay, and then we have um, a question on uh, ocular impairment. And uh, this is the following. If we can see cysteine crystals in cornea, do we still need white cell cysteine for diagnosis? And do you do uh, corneal cysteine have any other differential possible diagnosis? Yeah, thank you very much for this question. I had actually no time to, um, to, uh, to talk in more detail about ocular cystinosis. Uh, there are two important things to see. Um, so um, ocular cystine crystals are actually not um, responsive uh, to our oral cystamine crystal, uh, cystamine therapy. So when you treat a patient with cystamine, we will not see any effect on their uh, crystal accumulation in the cornea. And therefore, cystinosis patients have to be treated with uh, the administration of eye drops containing cystamine. Thank you very much for asking this because maybe it was uh, um, unclear. Uh, so uh, these um, uh, crystals will not help you to monitor a cystamine treatment, uh, which is given uh, um, orally. Uh, okay, and we uh, still have another question on ocular cystinosis that I think is really important. 
is the following. Do we need to start cysta drop soon after cystinosis diagnosis in infancy or only after a crystals have developed later in the course of cystinosis? Yeah, this is a very important question and I think that um, we don't really know the clear answer. Even the ophthalmologists, they don't have the real consensus. I personally think uh, the earlier you will start the treatment, the better would be the prognosis. I think really that you don't have to wait until the patient will have the complaints. Uh, you can uh, start the treatment while there is still not so many crystals in the eyes. A lot of par uh, parents are a little bit afraid to, 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 to give eye drops um, to their very small kids. However, I think also this can be probably easier uh, taught to uh, young children than when they're a little bit older and um, can have like more uh, objections uh, um, to this administration. So my advice is to start uh, early um, and um, to, 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 to teach your uh, patients or your children to administer eye drops. Okay, and we still have two uh, questions on therapeutic uh, management in these patients. The first one is, how could we uh, monitor, <coughs> sorry, cystamine therapy if we, do not, if we do not have the facility to monitor leukocyte cysteine levels? Yeah, a very important question. Um, I know that um, uh, cysteine measurements in white blood cells are not available in all countries around the world. Um, so if um, this uh, possibility is not present, um, I think that you can um, just administer cystamine at their uh, dose that patient can support. And uh, you have the recommended doses range and I would just try to, um, uh, to administer it within this range and try to, co uh, to convince our patients to take the drug. Um, recently, uh, we have published um, another biomarker of cystinosis, which still needs to be confirmed in the bigger uh, clinical trials. However, this uh, marker, which is a macrophage activation enzyme, and I have told you that macrophages are very important cells in cystinosis because they get activated upon cystal or uh, crystal accumulation. So macrophages, when they are activated, they start uh, to produce an enzyme which is called chitotrisidase. And this enzyme can be measured in plasma of the patients. And recently, and this is uh, not yet published, uh, we have shown that there is a very good correlation uh, between um, uh, plasma concentration of chitotriosidase and uh, uh, cystine accumulation, and, but also with the deterioration of kidney function in these patients. So uh, although it is still very experimental, um, uh, maybe in the future this enzyme uh, will be used or could be, can be used as a clinical monitor of cystinosis. The advantage of this enzyme is that it's very stable. It can be determined in plasma, but even more importantly, it can be determined in dry blood spots. So actually blood of the patient can be taken, put on this spot and just sent by the regular mail to the laboratory, which can determine the activity. But once again, the utility of this test should be uh, confirmed in the large clinical trials. Okay, so thank you, Elena. We still have uh, two questions. What criteria would you take into account to initiate immediate or prolonged release therapy in cystinosis patients? Um, again, a very good question. I think that uh, prolonged um, release um, cystamine uh, therapy is not available in many countries and the price of this drug is quite high compared with uh, immediate release cystamine. So um, if, uh, um, if the two drugs uh, would be available, I think uh, this can really be discussed um, with the families. Um, obviously, um, a lot of our families and patients would choose for the drug which uh, has to be administered only uh, uh, twice per day, especially in patients uh, 
after kidney transplant patients who don't have any other treatments which have to be administered uh, more frequently. Uh, however, um, both drug contains the same uh, substance, which is cysteamine, so the profile of uh, side effects are, is quite similar. So I think it's a matter of the availability and uh, also the choice of the, of the, of the patient or the family. Okay, and I think it will be the last question uh, because time is uh, running. And uh, another question on uh, ocular cystinosis. Is there any study showing early hair drop application as good ocular outcomes uh, since there are cases of allergy and since hair drops are four times more costly than tablets? Um, well, once again, I think the treatment of cystinosis is um, consisting of oral cystiamine and the application of eye drops. So one treatment cannot replace the other one. You really need to use both treatments. And um, yeah, I hope that um, this is clear for everybody. So for the cornea cystine accumulation, you need to use eye drops. And for the systemic disease, you need to use uh, cysteamine systemically orally. Okay, so um, I think this was uh, the last question. I just double check. Yes, it was the last question. So I really would like to thank again, Elena, for her excellent presentation and a very clear uh, answers to uh, our questions. I would like to thank you all for your attendance to this webinar. And please don't mix uh, the next webinar um, coming soon. Bye-bye and have a great evening. Bye-bye. Thank you.